So the episode that we're doing tonight is Doctor Who, Season 11, Episode 2, The Ghost Monument. What would I say in terms of a non-spoiler review? I guess I would have to say that this is a decent episode. I like it better in terms of a story than I did the previous one. Um, it is not an amazing episode, but it is reasonably good for getting our feet wet with these characters. Last week, we sort of introduced them. They said, can you buy these guys? We said yes. Now we get to see how they interact with each other and how they do things. Um, the visual effects are consistent with what we come to expect from the show, which is really good. I continue to like the music, though it is no longer being done by Murray Gold. And I like the uh, sh uh, location shooting. Um, location shooting is such a freaking uh, uh, refreshing breath sometimes. Uh, I'm sure, however, there were lots of green screens used in places that I wouldn't have expected, but I do know that they credited a South African film unit. Dang, I bet that's the last time they do a South African shoot. They're about to have a complete massacre of whites down there. Anyway, I would definitely recommend this episode. And I would definitely say that, you know, keep in mind, we've only got eight episodes left of this season. This season's only ten episodes long to begin with, apparently. So we've only got eight left. So, basically, what I can say about the thing without getting into spoiler territory is over the over, so I will do my... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am the Fandai Master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst, I figure it out about a half an hour early. This is not a boast or a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years' worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the whole century that came before, and it sometimes does inhibit your ability to enjoy things. It was a little bit of the case this time around, um, just because not so much the science fiction, but because we have seen this uh, sort of scenario before. So, okay. Nah, spoilery stuff I can talk about. Well, the story. Um, I usually go into some level of depth, but this is a mini-review, the first time I've tried something like this, and also there wasn't that much to this story, really, when you boil it down to what it's about. A very brief synopsis might be something like the Doctor and her companions find themselves stranded on an alien planet with a pair of space pilots who are on the last leg of an intergalactic race. The Doctor and her companions must brave unknown terrors and do mighty deeds and boldly split infinitives that no man had split before. And by the end, the contest is ruled a draw and the Doctor and her companions find the target TARDIS. And uh, scene. That's it. Uh, there's certainly more details in there, but I'm going to assume if you've followed me after the spoiler, um, you must have watched this thing already. If not, you really shouldn't watch any further. Well, unless you're watching me live, in that case, come back in about 10 minutes or something like that. Put, put me on mute, and when the lower third changes back to Frankenstein, you'll know, or uh, Dracula. Okay, cringe moments. Always like to get my cringe moments out of the way first. The thing that just jumps out at me, and I watched a reactor after I'd written up the review, and uh, same thing hit her. These people, and it hits me every time now, ever since this film, these people have serious problems with Prometheus Syndrome. Now, if you don't know what Prometheus Syndrome is, it is a medical condition characterized by the ability to not, inability to get away from a falling object, such as a spacecraft that's coming right down on top of you. You tend to run straight in the direction of the crash, hoping that you'll be able to outrun this massive pile of fast-moving death, rather than scatter off to the sides. Happened here. Uh, and it's most famous to me in, in uh, Prometheus because, of course, you look at it and you go, why didn't she just go off to one side? And here the same thing happened. I went, why are these people running in front of this crashing? You go, go, go away. Go away from the crash, you know? Uh, so that was sort of a cringe moment for me. The Ryan Graham relationship uh, may become a cringe moment. I am terribly afraid that I know how this is going to work out. One other thing that wasn't exactly a cringe moment, but something the uh, producers might want to watch out for. Excuse me, my chair's gotten too low. 
something the producers might want to watch out for um, is um, Jody Whittaker's natural uh, leads dialogue. For those of us who are not from the UK and don't really know, you know, necessarily the intricacies of various individual dialects there, um, there was a point which she said, when she said, "Let's get shift on," that sounded to me exactly like "Let's get shit done." This is simply an issue with her dialect, and it might be something that producers might want to keep an eye on in future. You know, episodes just simply because not everybody who's going to watch this is from the UK. Um, certainly a big part of its audience is, but not everyone. Uh, it certainly sound like let's get shit done. Great moments in this episode I continue to like. Um, Graham, I will be talking about him more when I get into his performance, but I continue to like him. Um, they didn't draw out finding the TARDIS. I was terribly afraid that they were going to draw that out for the entire season, and I was glad that they did not. I think that I'm probably going to like that we're going to see the Stenza again. They were mentioned here. They were in the last episode. That uh, alien was in the last episode. They mentioned it again here. Uh, wouldn't be shocked if that means we don't uh, see from them again, perhaps throughout the series, season. We'll, we'll find out. Okay, getting into some of the specifics. The writer on this one was Chris Chibnall, again, the uh, story um, lead uh, writer and uh, showrunner for the show this uh, season. Writing is fine. It's fine. Um, it's a relatively simple plot with a bunch of, you know, okay, we have to get through these unknown terrors and do mighty deeds and boldness, but of infinitive, infinitive is part of it. But when it comes down to it in terms of a story, um, not all that terrifyingly unusual. We have seen this story before, uh, not just in science fiction. Uh, it's a mad, 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 mad world immediately came to mind. But we've also seen it in Star Trek Voyager where they have, you know, something going on where they have a chase or, you know, some kind of uh, race that they're into. Um, didn't strike me as bad and necessarily just a plot that's kind of used more than once. Uh, made it hard for me as the fan day master because I can see it coming. Um, but it, always need to remember too. This is the first episode of uh, where we actually get to see these characters doing things as characters and interacting with each other as characters. Um, last season, last episode was mostly just okay. Well, uh, we, can you buy these people? This one is okay. Here's how they kind of interact, and hopefully, we will start to see more character development that will pay off later on down the road. The actors in this one, Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. Um, she is, once again, we have a fast-talking, wise-cracking, let's-run kind of Doctor, uh, the way we did through uh, 9 through 11 in this one. So I like the fact that we have, you know, gotten back to that. I think it's one of the things, as I said last week, that uh, Whovians pretty much had come to expect from this show since the 2005 revival. And uh, going away from it with Capaldi was probably going to cost them viewers, and it did. And so coming back here is probably a very good thing. I certainly bought her, um, same as this week as I did last week. That wasn't a problem. There certainly isn't anything here that stretches Jodie Whittaker's talents as an actress, but again, I totally bought her. So There is Bradley Walsh playing Graham. I continue to enjoy Graham. Um, he is probably the only uh, uh, companion that I've really had any personal, real personal empathy for because he's my age. The guy is around my age. He is not in his physical phys peak physical condition. He's certainly a lot thinner than I am, but he's not in his peak physical condition. That was 20, 25 years ago. Um, I do like that from time to time when they stop running, that guy is practically falling down out of breath. He's so winded. I like that. Though I have to wonder, as I did when Capaldi was the doctor, whether this wouldn't prove to be problematic in the long term. The, again, the problem here is, you know, I said last week, if it was me and they made me the doctor, you know, unlike Capaldi, I would not even have been able to keep up the schedule for three years. Forget it. I'd have been dead man. But you certainly couldn't have me around running around. And that may be a problem with Graham going forward. I don't know. Uh, it may be that they just end up using him sometimes to hold down the fort rather than being out running around. I don't know. We'll have to see. I like the fact that he started out pretty much just along for the ride last time, but uh, he is now, uh, his wife was the brave one, really, 
and but he's now using his wife to draw some bravery, some courage from, by just asking the question, what would she say? And this time around, the answer was, you're on an alien planet. What are you complaining about? <laughs> I thought that was a real good one. I like that. Um, so far, he is the most developed of the characters, and I am interested to see where he goes. Excuse me, swallowed wrong. There is Amanda Gill as Yasmin. She does a fine performance here. As with last week, she is the person with the least to do. Um, she doesn't really have any character yet that we can pin down on her. And no doubt she will get some character development. But this is one of those things that I can like say I got into last week. It may be a problem for them. Because the 2005 series, since it's started up again, has basically, the shows have been not about the Doctor per se. They have been about the Companion. And in previous um, you know, seasons, we've only had one, maybe two Companions to deal with. And with Amy and Rory, they were practically a package deal. So developing either one of them meant some development of the other character. Here we have three people. And now, as of this next week, eight episodes in which to do character development and where they would have been able to focus on one individual the entire eight weeks here they have to break it up i'm not sure how that will work out for them we will see um, but yasmin again did not have a whole hell of a lot to do there wasn't much time to have her do things um, there were a lot of other characters in here so we'll see how that goes Tosin Cole plays Ryan. He is the second least to do in this episode, uh, aside from his relationship with Graham, that I'm afraid is going to be very, very predictable. Uh, he also spent some time reacting to things, looking scared at this or that, which is nice, but it's not really character development. You know, we don't really see these guys growing. It's just them reacting to certain things. Again, it may be a problem with having this many characters to have to deal with. Sean Dooley is uh, in this episode as Epso. He does a fine performance. I had problems with his face turn. Um, it's the same exact problem that I had with Captain Jack Harkness having a face turn. His second episode in with the Doctor. Practically on top of his first, really. He was supposed to be, this Captain Jack was supposed to be a con man who suddenly decided to go straight after, you know, a few hours around the Doctor. Similar deal here. He's supposed to be a confirmed, I won't trust anybody guy, except now that he's been around the doctor for a few hours. He has his face turned. I don't know. It may also be that with this unlimited amount of space, because oftentimes what Doctor Who episodes will do is they'll set you up with some guest characters that hopefully you'll start to care about because they'll impact the, uh, you know, the companions oftentimes. So we have this problem going forward already where we have triple the number of companions we usually do we have to character develop and now we're be, uh, being told okay are we going to actually try to develop the characters of these guest characters because that's not going to leave you with much time at all uh, it may be that in order to get all the character development done that needs to be done they just have to let go of the guest characters and focus more on the others i don't know we will see how it goes see how it goes Susan Lynch plays Angstrom, and she does a fine performance of the two ra uh, racers. She was uh, actually the most believable to me, easiest for me to buy. Though, again, uh, they didn't really have a lot of time for it. Um, you know, when she and Epso decided to call it, you know, a draw, um, I didn't care much anymore. You know, you knew that they weren't, nobody was going to die. You knew that. After, you know, you figured out, okay, these people are going to survive. You knew they weren't going to turn on each other and kill each other. So for me, it was mostly a question of how are they going to do this thing, not wh will they do this thing. And so to me, that wasn't all that interesting. It didn't have a lot of tension for me after we'd been told outright that they wouldn't be allowed to kill each other because then they're not, they're not going to go out and do something that's going to blow their fortune. <clears throat> Elin, Elin, who is the, um, and again, it may just be, it may just be that they have to lay off the guest characters. They may have to lay off those guest characters so they can focus on the regulars. Elin is played by Art Malik. Uh, fine performance. He doesn't have a lot to do here, although I do like the subtext he's playing. <laughs> From the moment he's told who they are, the doctor and her companions might as well not exist. Totally irrelevant, and he says so himself. 
production aspects of the show. This was directed by my, Mike Mark, sorry, Mark Tondurai. Uh, the direction is fine. Um, there is nothing that jumps out at me as being shockingly creative in this day and age. Uh, I did find it. I have to cough again. Excuse me. I don't even have the excuse of having dry, trying to breathe some water. Uh, anyway, I, I found uh, there was a uh, interesting contrast between dark and light going on here from time to time, because of course we had this very light sort of, I don't know, sort of South African plain type of environment, and then they would slip into complete darkness or areas that needed to be dark because it was night and things like that. So I, I thought the, uh, the the contrast between the two worked very well. Cinematography is by Tico Pulakakis. Um, now, I, as always, I never know what to credit as specifically to the cinematographer versus specifically to the director versus some kind of, uh, you know, collaboration going on between them. No idea. Just no idea. It's a little different when you get into TV, too, because you're working on a TV time and TV budget and TV schedule and... You don't have nearly as much time to prep for an episode as you might like. So I don't know what to uh, point necessarily to whom as to who did what. Uh, you just have to fall back on the standbys, the basics. You knew what you were supposed to look at, and you could see what you were supposed to, to see. With one minor exception, but I'm sure that's intentional. I'll get to that in a bit. Special effects are again by Des Anwar. He does the usual great job that we have come to expect with Doctor Who. Um, everything looks professional and good. It did not give me a moment where I went, wait, that looks fake, uh, like it did the last episode. So totally believable, fine. There's lots of green screen here. There's probably green screen in places I don't know where it is. Um, but it was all quite seamless and worked well. Now, having seen the new main titles, I don't know if this is him. I don't know how much this is uh, other people's choices in terms of how those main titles work. But having seen them now, um, I like them. Uh, it's To me, it's reminiscent of Doctors 1 through 4, to be perfectly honest. I think with, you know, the, the, the hints at what you're seeing swirling around in there are similar to what we saw with 1 through 3. And the whole color scheme seems to come out of, out of 4. And to some extent, 5. That, that theme song, too, to some extent. So I do like this. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, music that underscores it in the background, but I do like it. I think it's good. I, my, I, it's different from other, what we've seen in the past, but to me, it's got some echoes back, which fit with the music, by the way, um, and at the same time, some visual echoes. So I, I kind of like it. It's good. Production design is, again, by Arwell Jones. His production design is good throughout. It is a constant issue in Doctor Who. You know everything is going to look dated within 10 to 20 years. You can't avoid it. It always happens. Everything looks dated in 10 to 20 years. The technology always looks dated. So you have to ask yourself when you're making a show like this, what do we do? This show could be on another 50 years. How do we deal with the fact that it's going to look fake and phony in 10 to 20 years? Do we try to make things ultra fu futuristic and cross our fingers? Do we try to make it as futuristic as we can and cross our fingers? Well, the answer is no, none of the above. It's nothing. There is no way to avoid it. Everything always looks dated in 10 to 20 years. That's why I spend so much time and will tonight on context for uh, Dracula, because if without the context, it can look dated. So they do nothing. Everything's going to date. They know it. The whole notion is we're not going to worry about it. Let's let the production staff 10 or 20 years down the road deal with it. And they may deal with it exactly the same way that they did in Twice Upon a Time, where we got to see the uh, you know, bits and pieces of uh, the 10th planet with its extraordinarily outdated technology in terms of where the doctor was and what was holding him and things like that. And they just said, ah, screw it. We're just going to we're just going to play it the way it was. Not going to make any changes. Sorry. I did particularly like uh, the interior when it comes to, uh, you know, things like the production design. I did like the interior of the tent. Okay, this seems like a relatively simple thing to do, and it kind of is. Um, 
I know there must have been greens, greens in there that I wasn't aware of and didn't know about. Um, but the fact that it seemed to be at least mostly a real set and made up to do look like an Arabian uh, prince's uh, thing, as, as was a character. So I, I got a kick out of it. I thought that was nice. Uh, it showed, you know, there wasn't, there's a lot of functional sets this time around. Get us from point A to point B to point C. It's a deserted uh, city. Uh, you know, there's only so many ways you can do that. So um, I'm not quite sure what to think about the new console room set. Um, for me, it kind of peaked at Matt Smith's first console room. I didn't like it after that. Um, it's just hard to see. It's hard to see. It is a uh, lighting choice of that set. Don't know why, but it is lit fairly darkly. I suppose that's so that you can see the big lighted up crystal parts of it. But I couldn't see that much of it. So I'm not sure what to think about that set. Looks okay. Um, be looking forward to seeing more of it uh, as time goes on. I did like the fact that the, uh, the, the exit, entrance and exit of the TARDIS is no longer the front doors of the police box. It is actually the back of the uh, um, police box itself. Um, not a big deal, not even unprecedented. In the classic series, the entire outer shell of the TARDIS was completely invisible from the big white doors that opened. Um, so I don't have any problem with that, but I found it interesting. It was a slightly different change, kind of fun. Makeup is by Amy Riley. Um, make what, makeup is largely functional here. You know, it was supposed to tell us something about the characters, and they were human characters, so that we didn't have to kill ourselves with all kinds of makeup appliances. So that was fine. It was all very good. Underscored the characters well, I thought. Costumes are by Ray Holman. Again, these were mostly functional costumes. We needed something that looked like an environment suit, and that worked as an environment suit that they were wearing, uh, both as a space suit and later on. Uh, the Doctor and the Companions are wearing exactly what we saw them last. Not much to say there. Uh, and Elin looked like a, uh, an Arabian prince, which I thought was kind of nice, looking like an Arabian prince. Yay. Uh, underscored the character. Again, just underscored the character. Music is again by Sagun Akinola. Akinola sorry. Uh, I continue to like the music. As I said last week, this is the first year since the show came back in 2005 that Murray Gold has not done the music. And so some level of comparison between Murray Gold and Saguna Akinolo is uh, going to happen. I continue to like the music here as I liked it uh, the last time around. Um, it's not the sort of giant bombastic things that we'd grown used to with Murray Gold, but then who was going to do that, you know? Have to have your own stamp on it, and the uh, composer here does, and I think it's fine. Last week I mentioned when I was listening to the end titles, I wasn't sure what I thought about uh, the drum on the bass, you know, that bass line in the back. I think that may have been, I'll have to go back and watch last week's again maybe, but I think that may have been uh, me reacting to the fact that I was hearing it on a small handheld speaker. Uh, as opposed to my big stereo. When I heard it this time on the big stereo, I was like, oh, okay, no problem. I got no problem with that. I thought it worked really well. This is an example of how you can make that theme tune both creepy and inviting, but not menacing. Um, traditionally, it has been creepy and inviting, but not menacing. The two differences being um, McCoy's, Sylvester McCoy's Doctor's Theme and Peter Capaldi's. And as I talked last week, you don't take the doctor too dark because people stop watching. And the decision to go with a theme tune for Capaldi that was very nearly like screaming. You know, you got that sort of vibrato wail in it. Um, I think that contributed to his stories looking, feeling, and coming off kind of as horror stories that don't work well for Doctor Who. So here they have given you another example, not like they didn't need to. This thing is probably the most uh, popular and versatile uh, theme tunes ever made. Probably the mo mo most popular ever made. And it is that way because it, it survives so many different composers' take on it, and not just the ones that work for the show. There are whole fan composers who spend a lot of time reworking this for various things and seeing how this sounds and how that sounds. So the fact that it can survive all that, I, don't, I honestly don't know how many covers this thing I know about. Hundreds? Easily? Um, so the, the ability to even do that says to you it's a hell of a good theme song. But 
not going with that warbly, horrible scream the entire way through. I think it's a very good choice. So that nearly is the end of my mini review, which isn't bad. I didn't need a whole, uh, eat up an entire half hour for it. <laughs> so at the end of the review, we usually ask ourselves, is it any good? Yes, it is well made. It is not a brilliant episode, but good. Um, I would prefer watching this over the visually washed out horror stories we've been treated to for the last three years. So there's that. Again, as I said last week, not Capaldi's fault. That is not Capaldi's fault. It is the fault of the crappy writing of one Stephen Moffat who jumped the shark with The Day of the Doctor. This is definitely an episode that is good for getting our feet wet in terms of trying to you know, come to with how do these characters act with each other. The visual effects, as I said, remain to be excellent. The, uh, I continue to like this music, and I thought the location shooting was very refreshing, and I definitely recommend watching this. Again, I have to point out, they've only got eight more episodes left in this series. All they got is eight. Duh. It's going to be really interesting to see what they do with uh, things like, uh, oh, I don't know, character development and stuff like that. Okay, let me get back to my regular review. So I'm going to leave a pause here to fade out when I do the editing. Okay. Oh, that's not what I wanted to show. Oh, what the hell, I'll go ahead and show it anyway. Uh, this is a picture that I took. <laughs> I hadn't actually intended to put this in here. <laughs> this is a picture that I took uh, when we were, um, my kids and I went to see uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens. It was not too long. I don't remember what they were showing in theaters. It was Doctor Who at the time, but it wasn't too long uh, after uh, they had uh, done something where they were showing some Doctor Who episode or episodes in a movie theater. And so the local uh, fan club or somebody had put up this uh, police box out in front. So, of course, I got my picture with it. And as you can see there, I'm actually holding my own sonic screwdriver. See if I can get in here. 